Thank you for tuning in to another episode of In Range. We are at the World War One themed two gun action challenge match, and we're with Roland here, all the way from Australia. G'day, pleasure to be here. <laughs> I can't believe you're all the way out here, not only for this match, right? No, we did Red October and we've uh, collected some training while we're here, myself and my good friend Dylan. Fantastic. So, one of the things I think would be really interesting to talk about is you're a competitive shooter in Australia, correct? Correct, yes. Uh, our audience probably thinks that one, some of them probably thinks that Australia doesn't exist. We know that that's a, a myth. But second, they probably don't think people shoot in Australia. Yes, contrary to popular belief, uh, we can own firearms, and uh, although there is some legal process we need to go through to, uh, well, to obtain a license, permits to acquire to buy new rifles, um, the target sports in Australia is well and truly all right. A lot, everything from full bore, service rifle, field rifle match, and the pistol sports. IPSC is a very large sport in Australia. So is cowboy action. Cowboy action, really? Oh, cool. Wow. So today you are shooting an actual 308 Ishapur Enfield because you borrowed one of my rifles. This is true. With a, with a proper bayonet on it. Tried to get you something you might be used to, but a little different. And you shot an incredible stage, but did you notice anything about this gun that was awkward or different for you? Um, let's just say Indian manufacturing uh, has some interesting tolerances. Um, the Charger Bridge Guide in particular, it was a very noticeable uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. um, in a 303, you can almost, uh, sorry if you are right there. That's right. So in a 303, you can pretty much throw the stripper clip into the charger bridge and with your thumb or with the palm of your hand, get it in there. With this thing, you really have to point that charger at the charger bridge hmm. and uh, get that all the way in. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other issues with the gun besides that? No, the gun ran flawlessly. Uh, rimless, rimless ammunition makes a big difference. It really does. That's yeah. a huge advantage. Why don't you talk about your experience with that, Ian? Oh, with uh, Enfield? Yeah, yeah well, I have yet to, I think, make it through a match with a 303 that hasn't had some sort of mechanical failure on the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just rimmed cartridges are obsolete. And, you know, what's interesting to me is that this is the number one pattern um, SMLE, which is, of course, what the entire Commonwealth was using during World War I. Mm -hmm. Although, actually, it wasn't a Commonwealth during World War I, was it? Uh, no, we were the Commonwealth, yes. Okay. It, was the, it was still the Empire, but we were considered okay. part of it. Okay. At any rate, everyone had the number one Mark III. Uh, by World War II, it kind of split, and Australia never actually started making the number four Enfield. No, um, the Lift Go uh, factory continued right. to manufacture all the way through. Uh, almost into, well, we were still refurbished them in 1957. Yeah, and Ishapur in India also continued to make the number one. They went ahead and updated it to 762 NATO. Australia didn't. No, we went directly to the SLR. Yeah. So that's a question I had in my mind. So. It, it, this being the World War One pattern rifle and the improvements to the Mark IV are kind of evident in terms of the aperture sight, for example. Why did Australia and India stick with that first pattern rifle, or Mark I? Uh, it really came down to the cost of retooling. Um, and you know, when was the Empire expected to be at war again? Okay. Um, you know, we were very familiar with the number one action, and we continued to carry that all the way through Korea as well. Oh, wow. Fascinating. The number four didn't come into production until right on the cusp of World War II. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. So, did you enjoy it so far? It's been an absolute blast. We've, uh, I hope I've set a good stage and represented Australia well, but uh, we'll see how we go at the end of stage two and three. I'll tell you I what, from what so. I saw of your time, I think you're the stage winner on that one already, so. Uh, I have a little bit of experience in feeding the Lee Enfield quite quickly. Uh, in my service rifle club, we're not a traditional service rifle club. We do do movement, we do do snap exposures, mm. and uh, we have whole nice. competitions dedicated to how fast you can run the gun. Oh, that's excellent. So that's more aligned with what we're doing here. You know, Ian, this is something we noticed in Finland, and we talked about it on the video. It's not that um, it's not that American shooters aren't dedicated to shooting, but when you are a shooter from another country that we're firearms on is harder or there's like a, a higher bar of entry to get to that. We have uh, Finland and Australia and etc. when they are competitive shooters they put more effort into it because it's so hard to get there that if you're going to get that license and get the gun you know what you're going to do? You're going to go train with it as opposed to where it's a little bit easier to get it. It's maybe more casual. Correct. So when I watch you shooting I'm like yeah I spent a lot of time by the trigger. <laughs> Definitely. So guys thank you for tuning into this. Stay tuned for more World War One themed two gun action challenge match. Thank you for coming all the way from Australia to shoot this with us. We're having a lot of fun. Let's keep going. Awesome.